<laughs> Hello, this is our second talk for today. This is uh, Jonathan Thomas Palmer. Uh, I, I know him through Twitter interactions, and um, my students have used many of his videos as helpful reviews. And, hey, we didn't have time to go over this stuff before the AP exam, and here's some great notes and other things. Uh, and he has some, some interesting characters in his videos that he's developed through the years. And uh, people that are interested in flipping a classroom would be wise to take notes and share the material, I think. And he loves puns, is what I took from his pre-registration form that said, lack of puns is needed in this, in this uh, talk. <laughs> so, hi, Jonathan. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I'll actually start here, which is not up there, but I'm going to start here. Um, three and a half weeks ago, I was commuting to school on my bike, and I went across a wooden bridge. Uh, and I was going too fast, and it was a little bit wet, and I tried to turn. Uh, and I fell, and I um, hit my whole left side of my body on the wood, and um, I ended up breaking four ribs. Uh, I passed out because it was so painful. I was wearing my helmet, which worked yeah. all good there. Uh, and I've been doing pretty well. And then just about 20 minutes ago, something. No. I mean, I'm I'm okay. I did, just took some meds, but so I'm. I don't know. I felt like sharing. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm not doing the handstand today. It's been. I haven't been able to ride my bike to school. Anyway. Huh. Uh, You're gonna push on, man. That is. Yeah. Like, that no, but I I did. Uh, I did go to school and teach that day. Because I hate missing class. I don't know how everybody else feels, but like it's harder to miss class than it is to just be there. Anyway, um, and we actually had professional development in the afternoon. I went to that. Whoa. <laughs> you got, like, I'm sorry, but you got to get the hours in the beginning of the year because you never know what's going to happen. I have kids. Anyway. Oh, hi. So uh, I've been teaching high school physics for 18 years. I actually started as a mechanical engineer. Uh, that didn't stick. Uh, this is much better. Uh, I've taught general physics, college prep physics, AP physics B, AP physics C, mechanics, and AP physics C, electricity and magnetism. Um, a lot of different physicses. Uh, the college prep physics class that I taught, uh, I stopped teaching at this school, and this probably has been turned into AP physics 1. It was about 95% the same curriculum, so it probably has been switched over to that at this point. Um, in 2013, I switched schools. I became part-time. I now teach at a different school, and I teach a class that's just called physics. It's a smaller school, completely non-track. We don't have any AP courses, and I have kids in there that struggle with algebra all the way to taking Calc 3 at the local university. So it's a, it's a really fun group to work with um, and challenging. So uh, the, the reason I went part-time is so I could make pre- Physics educational videos and show of hands who's seen my videos. Okay, we have a okay. So I'll do this. I'm not going to show you any of the videos, but I'll just talk about them. I have a whiteboard in my basement, and I film, and I try to illustrate as many of the topics as possible. Uh, I have three students: Billy, Bobby, and Bo. Each one with their own individual personality. Um, and I film them separately, but then split screen, put them all together so that they are on the screen at the same time. And they interact and don't get along and all those things. <laughs> um, as I said, I try to make do as many demonstrations as I can. I'm just These are just a couple of things that I walk my way through, just various demonstrations. Uh, this is one of my favorites. I dropped a uh, ball from a moving vehicle. And you can figure out how far in front of it to drop the ball such that it lands in the bucket. Lots of fun. I did this for like 13 years in class as a theoretical, and then I was like, well, this is something we can actually do. Um, and it's really fun to go through the challenges of taking something that you do on the board and then actually trying to do it. That's what I love to do. Um, and it is a struggle. I was actually just, anyway, I, don't, I don't know how much I'm going to get distracted here, but I am. Uh, just last week, uh, I was filming something, I was doing a demonstration, and it just started failing, and I couldn't figure out why. Anyway, it's just me in my basement struggling with some physics stuff. <laughs> All right. Anyway, so that's uh, what I do 
And I just to be clear, I make all these videos and I share them. And you are my target audience, and they're all free. I have 40 hours of videos now. I don't know how many numbers of videos, but I have 40 hours of videos like that. Uh, and I do want to take a moment and Ted say I'm excited because what you are talking about dovetails with what I do really well. Even I, I have a video called Memorizing versus Understanding in Physics that I made because I have so, I, like I have a subset of students every year who excel in math and fail at physics. Uh, and it took me a long time to figure out that what they are doing is they're using pattern recognition. And that's it. That's how they study. Um, and it's getting those kids past the pattern recognition. Because you all know in physics that I can give you a problem and just change the words slightly, and it makes it an entirely different problem, even though it's the same topic, right? the way you have to solve it. Um, so I'm really excited to highlight what you gave us and give it to my students. Sorry, that was a joke. Yeah, that was nice. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, um, so we're here to learn about flip, flipping education. I, I'm looking for you guys to be supportive of one another and of me and ask questions, give suggestions. I am not like the guy who knows everything about flipping, I'm just a guy who's been doing it for five years. Okay, so when you have suggestions, if you have questions, comments, I want to hear it all the way throughout. Basic idea of what we're going to do today is we're going to define flipped learning. I'm going to show the differences between traditional and flipped education. We're going to talk about why we want to flip. We're going to talk about Edpuzzle, which is a program I use to flip. Uh, I'm going to talk about why that is, and it's a very important piece. Uh, my flipped learning suggestions, and of course, time for questions and comments throughout. So, according to the Flipped Learning <coughs> Network, flipped learning is a pedagogical approach in which the direct instruction moves from the group learning space to the individual learning space. The basic idea is you take the lecture and you do that someplace that's not here, right? Because really, the lecture is where you need the teacher the least. Where you need the teacher is when the student is struggling to understand the material. That's when you need the teacher. And generally, that's done at home with something we call homework. Um, so what happens is the resulting group space, which is where we are right now, is transformed into a dynamic, interactive learning environment where the educator guides students as they apply concepts and engage creatively in the subject matter. So it's a very different way of looking at teaching. We're no longer the person who stands up here and disseminates information, but rather the information has been disseminated before and you come to class and we spend more time working with it, processing the information. Uh, so, a flipped classroom is just one component of flipped learning. The flipped learning uh, community is very subtle and clear on this. So the flipped classroom is just the idea of taking the instruction and doing it at home, and the stuff that's at home doing here. But the idea of flipped learning is that once you do that, it actually can make a huge transformation in what happens with the learning. So a flipped classroom, a flipping a classroom is not interchangeable with flipped learning. Uh, so all this stuff, by the way, I'm getting from the Flipped Learning Network on their website. So I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but it's a flexible environment, learning culture, intentional content, and professional educator. And there's even a checklist of 11 indicators that ed educators must incorporate into their practice. And I'm hoping uh, that I could just share my presentation with you, and you guys will get a link to this later, because I didn't take any notes on Ted's thing, and I want to know a lot of stuff that he was talking about. So I uh, will be sharing this with you. So this so is the website where I got all your content. That's going to cost me that. Uh, <laughs> I know. I, I, I do. I give away all my content. OK. So I'm going to actually start with the question I receive most often, which is, what if students don't, go, don't do their homework? Right? I'm sure that's what many of you are thinking right now. OK? So I ask you the question, what if students don't do their homework? Like, how is this any different? We always have students who don't do their homework. It's just that in the flipped learning environment, the homework is the beginning of the learning. And so in my opinion and in my experience, you have to stress that they have to do their homework. And using Edpuzzle, which I'll talk about later, you know if they've done their homework even before they come to class. So option number one, as far as I'm concerned, if they don't do their homework, and the homework, to be clear, is watching the videos before they come to class, is option number one. Do not give them time in class to do it. 
Uh, I've talked to various flipped educators and who have tried doing this, and it is not, or who have tried this, not option number one, which is to give them time in class to do it. Um, and not option number two, which is to do their homework for them. I've had, I've talked to flipped learning educators who the students like don't do the homework, then they come in and the teacher feels bad, so that then they lecture to them is basically doing their homework for them. So as far as I'm concerned, really the only option is you need to show them that they have to do their homework by continuing to move on. You, you just have to. And I, I found that that is the most successful way to, to get them to do their homework and to use Edpuzzle, which I'll talk about in a little bit. So in summary, please do not teach them the stuff they were supposed to learn in the homework. Okay. So I want to talk about why flipping? We're going to watch a video in a moment which is going to show two classes, one traditional and one flipped. They're filmed one year apart. They're covering the exact same topics the same day in the schedule. I want to know what you hear. Here we go. So this is the traditional, and this is the flip. We're going to hear the traditional first. We can start with Amper's Law. Close uh, loop integral b dot ds equals mu dot times current on the inside. Okay, uh, let's see. We know v is up, ds is also up. Okay, real quick, tell me what you heard. You know a lot of physics. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. You heard me talking a lot. I know a lot of physics. I, I like that summary. Okay. Now we're going to sit up no, again. This is the same class covering the same topics. Therefore, what do you hear? Students talking. Yeah. Quick thought on that. There's uh, this website. It's like a teacher's network one that you've seen where it has different expert teachers in high schools discussing it. A great line on that one right there is the teacher said, "The one doing the talking is the one doing the learning." <laughs> I, you I know, know, and that's what it means. Wow. Absolutely. And and that's in the the whole idea with the flipped classroom is to create the space in the class for the students to learn. So I was absolutely serious about this, and I have really yet to have one. So I'm going to pause. I would not be sitting out there this whole time and not have a question. Yeah. Do you give them a pre-test as soon as they step into the classroom? Do I give them a pre-test? A pre-test as soon as they to see if they, you know, something simple to check to see if they did their homework. Oh, oh, to see if they've done their homework. I'm totally going to talk about that. I have a specific way that I know. I not only know. If they've done their homework, I know uh, what they understood from their homework. All right, I'll keep going. What, uh, what if you were moving to an online class, say a couple days a week, and the rest is in class? What potholes are there with something like that that you have to be concerned about? So, what do you mean by an online class that meets a couple days? What do you our, mean? Our curriculum hybrid. where we're talking about our chemistry going to like. Two days late, they come in for labs, and the rest of the time is outside of class without the teacher. Okay, I think that's a terrible idea. Personally, <laughs> we got it on video. Uh, uh, <laughs> that's why. And, and the, the reason why is the whole, the only reason this works is because you're creating the space in class for the students to struggle, right? That's where the learning occurs. So, just one specific example uh, before I flipped my classes, with labs, we would do half the lab in class, which was you know collect the data and begin struggle through collecting the data and then begin working with the data. And then the next day, it would be due at the beginning of class because I've got to keep going, right? So they process a lot of the information. They're forced to do that at home. But with the flipped learning, now I have both of those classes where the lab is now due at the end of class instead. So 
they spend the first day collecting the data and then starting to work on the understanding it. Then they go home and they get as far as they can and they come in at the beginning of class and they have a bunch of questions for me. And then they can then work through those questions and get all the way through it. So uh, <laughs> the, this is not an online class, right? You're not taking everything and putting it online. You're creating space in the class for more learning. So, one of the main components of a flipped class is the videos. Um, and you are in a position where you're lucky enough to have enough crazy people like me who've made videos that you can use. So I'm not going to walk through how to make your own videos. We're making one right now. This, it's as easy as this. You can just do a, a video like this to make your own videos if you want to. But there are all sorts of places you can get videos. There are free online content resources. These are places that uh, call through information or videos and specifically put them together for you. And these are free physics YouTube channels. One of them's in bold. <laughs> um, but these are all people who have made physics videos that you can use. Yeah? Why just videos? Why not reading? Why not reading? So I'll tell you, in my class, it's a combination of reading and video. And we survey the students, and some of them prefer the reading, and some of them prefer the video. Okay. In my class, I tried the reading, and no one wanted to do it. Our, our report, freshman college mm -hmm. students, is that it's a 50-50 split. Interesting. 50% prefer the reading, 50% prefer the video. Um, it might be the videos. <laughs> I don't make the videos. Right, so right. they're fabulous. <laughs> so, I, like, yeah. so I use my own videos. Um, the other argument I would make yeah. is that getting information from reading is a fundamental skill that our students are getting worse at, and the videos are making it a little too easy for them to not get that skill. Okay. So I always have a little bit of concern whenever people make the videos synonymous with flipping. Okay, I can I can so, totally understand that. Right, and, so I just yeah, wondered I could, what your experience was. Because, my experience, yeah. I tried to get kids to read and I could not do it. It might be a difference between high school and college yeah. as well. Yeah. Uh, my, uh, sort of following up on that is, I within my folks, there's a lot of diversity as far as where they would find information when it comes to finding videos. They will go to many of these. Oh, I look to YouTube. I look to things I don't even know. I don't. Only, I only know about two of those that are listed right now. Okay. And it's like, wow. So I don't know what you are learning about stoichiometry because of your source. I need us to rein it back in and make sure we are looking at the same resource. We all have our textbook. I need us to know the information as it's presented in here, in this one, because this is our common ground. So. Do you find that you get, um, so that's led me to say, let me now support your learning from this textbook. Do you find, because within your set, that front end one is just only one part of it, so therefore you can make sure when you have these discussions and stuff, you're not concerned about the diversity of where they're getting it. Okay, because so. Because yours about the in-class subsequent conversation. So my students don't have a diversity of finding the information because I am defining specifically what they are what videos there. You don't think they then just Google it and say, oh. Uh, no, I provide them with plenty that I, I don't yeah. have students who. So you're sort of quality control on the front end. Yes, I'm okay. quality control on the front end. I'll show that specifically in a little bit. Okay, so end puzzle is, according to <laughs> techlearning.com, a site that allows users to select a video and customize it by editing, cropping, recording audio, and adding questions to make an engaging presentation or lesson. End puzzle is not the only game there's Edpuzzle, PlayPosit, and Zaption, okay? So when I went to do this, and by the way, I avoided using Edpuzzle. I, I avoided having a, um, a way, another thing for the students to log into, uh, just another a tool. I, really, I avoided it for three years, uh, trying to find various ways. I tried all sorts of things involving Google Docs and doing stuff at the beginning of class to try to assess students' learning and, and get them to ask me questions. Um, and it wasn't until I started using Edpuzzle that 
it really started to work. And I will point out that I actually started with Zaption, um, and I had made about 100 Edpuzzle lessons, and then I got an email from Zaption saying that they had been purchased, and the company that purchased them decided to completely shut them down. Nice. Which I think is one of the things that we struggle with as teachers with technology. Uh, and I see this in myself and in other teachers. I mean, I when I was at my first school district in the first 10 years, I had to redo my website four times because they kept changing the way things work. Uh, and I recognize that this is a struggle. And what was a wonderful thing was a week later after I'd been stressing about it, I got an email from Edpuzzle saying, hey, if you create an account from us, all you have to do is click this button and we'll suck in all of your Zaption lessons and make them into ours. So it was like click and it was yeah. wonderful, which is why I went with Edpuzzle rather than the other, because <laughs> they made it very easy for me. So the way Edpuzzle works is this. First off, be aware, this is my website. You're not going to look through everything here, but I want you to notice here it says Edpuzzle, Edpuzzle, Edpuzzle. Every one of these is a link to an Edpuzzle lesson that goes with one of my videos. About 95% of my videos have Edpuzzle lessons at this point, and I try to make them with all of them, but I'm a little bit behind with the Edpuzzle lessons. So the way the Edpuzzle lessons look is this. Let's do, let's do this one. So when a student opens up an Edpuzzle lesson, they get something that looks like this, and they watch the video. When they get to a point in the video, it pauses and asks them a question. Okay, so do we have a radius in the problem? What variable is listed? Okay, so I make sure that my Edpuzzle lesson questions are not extensions of the learning. They're simply just reiterating the learning. It's a way to basically make sure that they're watching and understanding, have a basic understanding of what they're doing. In addition to that, so you can do multiple choice, you can have comments, uh, you can have pre-response. So I did something incorrect in here, and I'm asking them what, what mistake did they make. So this is a major piece of my videos. I include mistakes in my videos that students commonly make, and then I correct them in the videos. So in this instance, Billy's made a mistake, he forgot to convert uh, these were given in grams, not kilograms, so you forgot to, got, forgot to convert them. So I've asked that question. So you can see, as the students watch the videos, they are asked these questions. Okay. So me, then I, in Edpuzzle, can look at all of the assignments that the students have watched. So if you look, I can just pick a video. Let's go out here. We'll go here. So I can see who's watched what. So these are all my students and you can see exactly who's watched what. If I click on a student I can see what they've watched. You can see each one of the ones lists that they've watched at one time. This student right here watched this portion of the video actually twice. So hmm. you have a lot of information about who's done the homework. You even get Going back. Can you explain how that works? Are they watching the So they, they log into Edpuzzle and then they watch the videos through Edpuzzle. And so Edpuzzle, and they actually can't skip forward, they can skip back. So once they've watched it, they can go back and watch, but they can't skip forward. And then I get answers to their questions. Okay, so I have I've asked a question here and I get all of their answers. And I could look at the next question, and I could see that 87% of the students got this one right. right. So before class even starts, I get feedback about how the students are doing with their understanding of the lecture. So think about that. I start class with an understanding of, OK, I know these three students are really struggling with this particular piece. Okay, it's. It, it, it was transformative for me. So helpful. Um, let's see. Oh, and actually, I want to show this one too. So, in fact, I asked, I started asking this question partway through 
um, which was I have a a video which <laughs> I actually walk talk about the fact that for uh, my first um, seven years of teaching, I was spelling uniformly incorrectly, <laughs> um, and none of my students ever pointed it out to me. Uh, <laughs> We all struggle with various things. One of mine is I'm a terrible speller. I cannot spell. Okay? So I've started asking <coughs> periodically just an open-ended question, what do you struggle with in physics? And literally, I, I, <laughs> I get to really long answers. And what I've started to do is, after I periodically ask this question, I now have time in class I wander around with their answers to this question, and I have individual conversations with each student about how they answered that question. And it's been transformative. Like, we get to the point where our kid's like, literally saying, I don't understand sig figs. We're like four weeks into the class. How is it that you don't understand sig figs, and how is it that I haven't noticed? Well, here we are. Let's have a conversation about it. Okay, so I, it's transformative. I really love using add puzzle. So let's pretend for a moment that you don't actually like my content and you want to use somebody else's content. <laughs> I don't know I know how, how that would be, but <laughs> you can go and you can search for, for example, conservation of momentum. And you could take, oh look, there's this one. Um, that's me. Uh, so you could take somebody else's lesson and you click edit. And what you now do is you have control to be able to crop the video and you can go through and you can make changes to all of the quizzes. So any Edpuzzle lesson that I have created, you can take and make your own. You can even take and pause it right in the middle and record your own voice to give some sort of statement to your students about whatever it is that you might want to do to make it, again, take somebody else's video and make it your own. It's a really powerful tool, and it's, I don't know what else to say. It's a really powerful tool, and I've, I've really loved using it. How long have you been using that now? Uh, it has been, this is my third year, so just over okay. two years. This is my third year. All right, let's go back to here. Okay, so how do I use Edpuzzle? So all of my Edpuzzle lessons are due by 7 a.m. My class starts at 7.45. I get there at roughly 7 a.m. every day, and I check their progress. So generally what happens is I will start class by saying, okay, this was the Edpuzzle lesson homework for today. There was this one question that everybody struggled with. We're going to talk about that. Then when students are working on whatever they need to be working on, I will wander around and I will talk to whatever individual issues that students have. Because sometimes there's one student that's struggling with one particular issue. Now, I make sure that I'm grading Edpuzzle lessons for completeness only, uh, because it's not a quiz. All I'm trying to, I'm trying to get feedback so that I can assess what they do and do not understand so that I can model the, what we're going to do in class based on that. It's an important piece. Uh, and to that end, I do make it so the Edpuzzle lessons, even though this is homework, they can always do it. Because even if it's late, they can still get half credit. Because it's basically you have to do the Edpuzzle lessons. <laughs> yeah? What's the breakdown of how much each thing you do is worth? Uh, so I do everything on straight points. So it doesn't work out perfectly. I don't do like a 40, 40, 20 or anything like that. Uh, so the final exam is 20%. Quizzes are roughly 20%. Um, <clears throat> no, they're actually less than that. I think they're like 15%. Labs are like 30%. Homework, which is literally just Ed Puzzle lessons, are like 15%. And then projects. And then I make homework optional, but I provide all of the solutions to my homework. Uh, and students can turn it in, and basically, if they do it, they have more points that everything's out of, so the percentage that like their final exam is worth is less, for example. Mm. That's a rough estimate, yeah. Um, 
I'm thinking about the uh, managing student expectations here. Now, would it, have you ever encountered a situation when a student on Tuesday night, 10 p.m., sent in a question to a professor and said, I don't understand this part of the video. Can you help me with it? How do you Right, so, so this is one of the downfalls of not having, like in a lecture, a student can ask a question right away, right? So that's something we address the next day in class. I can't, like, I'm just not able to address those. Like, How can you manage that? I can't, I can't do it in real time like that. So it's something we do in class. Uh, it hasn't been that much of an issue, but it is every once in a while an issue where a student really struggles with something in the middle. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. I mean, you have enough videos to almost do every lesson throughout the year. Yeah. So like the next day, do you assign them all like to the beginning of the week? Or okay, this is what we're doing Monday, this is what we're doing Tuesday? I have statistics on that. I will show you my statistics specifically on that in, in just a minute. And uh, the next day uh, during working class, is it, is it a combination of some sort of a lecture tutorial where they're kind of reading, going through something as a group okay. discussion? Or here's so a <clears throat> when I first started flipping my classes, uh, I had zero lecture. And the feedback from the students was that they actually wanted lecture, which I thought was really interesting. Uh, and the, the main reason for that was, there were two main reasons, was there was a, a loss of camaraderie if there's no lecture. Like they, they felt like we weren't doing stuff as much together. And they wanted the social peer pressure, the positive peer pressure, because when I lecture, I'm always calling on students. So they wanted that positive peer pressure to force them to be understanding the material more, which I found was really interesting. So I do some lecture in class still, but if you just think about it, the majority of the time for uh, the lecture is now just replaced with more time to work with the students. Um, I'm going to talk about asynchronous flipped gameful mastery learning, which is the state of my class now. I've been doing that for since January of this year, hmm. which is the difference between a flipped classroom and flipped learning. Uh, I've spent a long time, like four years, flipping my classes without actually making any significant changes to the class. Um, but now it's very different. Ted. There's definitely, uh, for any of these, we they're all within the the game or the, the setup of, okay, here's things that have to have points attached to them and in order to drive completion of the task. And I mean, we're all within that as far as how we allocate and how we distribute within that. When you were describing then these were the components, I find myself running in my head then, okay, so which of these would be back in my category of completion versus understanding? And it's not an, uh, wrong way, but I definitely hear, I think yours is with a higher proportion of completion. That's not wrong because, you know, you're making the choice, hey, I need you to complete this because I think it's also going to support understanding right. in a different way. But I'm, I'm listening to that of, okay, so that's when my students think, okay, they're completing this. You know, that it's a switch from one setup to right. another. And I, I would be, make, be making the same choices that you are of, hey, I need to value completion in this way. But that's sort of a transition. So what it does is it, it values the completion of those items. But by doing so, it creates the space in the class where yeah. I can have individual conversations with students. And they can converse with me mm -hmm. and with one another and yeah. do have better understanding that, that way. That's what I found. Another question. Oh, yeah, just say, yeah, go Sorry. ahead. Go ahead. That's fine. Do you use textbook pen? Do I use? Do you still use textbook pen? Oh, I, I don't use a textbook at all. all no, nope, I don't use a textbook at all. I do have uh, what I call practice problems. They're not homework problems, but I have practice problems. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Sorry, about your question. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> this is my voice, and it's not working very well. Um, but so, so we've, we've been flipped for about six years now. And, and so Ted, we've been kind of hitting the middle, I think. So it's not a completion grade, but we have them do an online quiz as well. But mm -hmm. it's very low level Zoom taxonomy. So like, what are our most important points that we want them to get out of it? But the other piece, if that's not practical, that we've added is that we've added the peer pressure piece through starting off almost every class with what we call a daily activity. 
So, and different instructors that I teach in parallel with do it different ways, but one of the things that we do is this activity. So the first thing that I have them do is, okay, get out a whiteboard, get out your markers, here's a question that you all need to talk about and put up an answer to, you know, in the first five minutes of the class. And basically, if they haven't done their work, it's going to be a very uncomfortable conversation for them. Everybody does it. It, it works really, really well. So the combination of the quiz and this group thing to talk about the material right away, everybody does it. What's your class size? Um, well, chunks of 36, because um, we're lucky. But you know, there's 400 and some kids in the program. So we're doing it every night. I mean, uh, the real, if you want if the change in mindset is if you can convince the student that it is about their their understanding and their awareness of that understanding and then the goal that they need to reach, that then transforms, okay, what are you asking them to do and what are the points attached? Okay, you did these five questions. I don't need to say now there's this in-class accountability. Did those five, are you, are you able to say, yes, I know how to do this? Not because you're gonna have this experience then in class, but do you know how to do it? You know, I mean, it, right. that's like, what, that's changed my experience is instead of saying, let me have this really framework that catches you to, no, I need you to be a, a learner where you are doing that. You know, that it's a right. very different scaffolding of moving them through. Yeah, so I'm going to talk more about that this afternoon because yeah. I've switched to a mastery learning setup. Okay. And I actually provide my students with all solutions to homework and worksheets, all sorts of problems. I don't give them solutions to labs, et cetera, but uh, I found that by providing them with all of the solutions, it makes it, some, it makes it more of a learning tool for them, and they have to pass each quiz or they can't move on. They have to illustrate that they've learned it. All right, I'll move on. Okay, so I wanna come back to why flipping. So flipped is a lot more student-driven. Uh, I, I know my students much better now that it's flipped because I just spend more time talking individually with my students, which is great. And it's a, it's a lot more flexible. So um, it used to be that all of my assignments were due at the beginning of class, right? But now they're actually due by the end of class and I'm a lot more flexible with those due dates. And that also means that the class needs to be more flexible because I'll have kids who finish one assignment in the middle of class and they have to be able to start the next assignment while other kids are not done. So it does confuse things a little bit more because there's a lot more overlap in who's doing what, when. Um, I don't have that on the screen. So, some flipped learning suggestions. So, if you're going to do this, you really have to get everybody on board before you do so. <laughs> Uh, I talked to my administrators first before I was planning to flip my classes, um, and I got them on board. Uh, I was the first in my school district to do so, uh, and then I gave out a letter to the students and parents and just got, was very clear about what we were going to do, um, but it's really, you need to get everybody on board. Uh, you need to teach your students how to learn from a video. I have a tendency to just zone out when they watch things, and believe it or not, I have a video about how to learn from a video. <laughs> um, it's called How to Learn from a Flipping Educational Video, and it stars, it starts with uh, Bo learning from a video in the way that a lot of your students would do it if they're not learned, if they're not trained to, which is uh, with their phone, their tablet, a TV, and all sorts of different things going at the same time. And really, you, you've got to just put a, be able to put away distractions when you're learning from a video. Uh, and it's not something they're good at, so you really do have to teach them how to do it. Uh, one of the deals I made with my students when I flipped my classes the first time was I was not going to add work for the students. Um, if you think about the way I described it, I now have just a lot more time in class, and the tendency as a teacher is to want to fill that time with something. Uh, so I... I've stuck to this. Anytime I add something, I have to find something that, that I can take away as well. So you really, it, it's not, you, you as a teacher need to let go of this moment. You need to be more able to be out there with the students. Um, I 
I have limited myself to no more than 15 minutes of Edpuzzle lesson homework per day. Uh, and this is uh, on a standard schedule. We're actually on a block schedule. So um, I actually do it 30 minutes per class period, per class day, because we have 100 minute classes that meet every other day. So my statistics look like this. From first semester, I have one or 71 mandatory videos. And the average length of the videos is seven minutes. And so the number of 50 minute, 55 minute class periods equivalent is 83. And so the average video homework is six minutes. And what's interesting is the homework in a topic is now front loaded rather than right before the test. Because the homework, most of the homework is the initial learning. So when you're starting a new topic, you now have your homework to learn from the videos. Um, as opposed to in a traditional classroom where a lot of their homework then is studying for the test right before the test. Uh, and I also do have optional videos which they can choose to watch. Again, um, they're optional. So I do have more suggestions. Uh, I have all my assignments due by the end of class now because really they're, they're trying to work on it and the whole idea is to have you there when they're working on it. Um, and I, I talked about it a little bit before, but you, you need to be able to be flexible to have some students working on the next assignment while other students are working on the previous assignment, which is a little bit difficult to, was hard for me at the beginning. Uh, and as I talked about, I do still lecture a little bit. And uh, I found that because the Ed Puzzle lessons were the main homework, uh, at the end of every class, I talk about what we're going to do the next class so that they know what's going to be due and when, and they can assess how much other homework they might have to do. So some students got you know, two-thirds of the way through the lab. Some students only got halfway through the lab. You really need to be two-thirds of the way through the lab by the time class starts next time. You really have to be clear about what the homework is going to be. I also have uh, the ongoing optional assignment, which I talked about, which is really helpful. I have optional practice problems, which are periodically due, and all the solutions are posted online. So if a student gets done with one assignment way before some other, assign uh, some other students, they can always be working on the optional practice problems, which is really helpful. More questions? Yeah? So I'm just going to check and make sure Edpuzzle is the way that you use it. Is it free or does it cost your school? Uh, it is free to a limited extent. I believe you get 20 or 30 Edpuzzle lessons for free. 20. Is it 20? Okay. It's 20 Edpuzzle lessons for free. Uh, you can pay for it. I don't actually know how much it is. Um, I have a free month. Okay. Yeah, my, my district pays for it. I think that's what it was. Okay. We have accounts. I get it for free because I have a lot of videos. <laughs> <laughs> It's free to the students, yeah. Yeah, um, Ted. I, I've avoided making videos just because it seems like an insurmountable task on my front end, but uh, let me just, I, I'll just, there's a good chance that I'm going to be asked to design three or four online courses. So it's coming around. Uh, yeah. Now, I saw, though, a colleague who's down at Ohio that is a uh, flip chemistry class, uh, general chemistry, Huge number of videos within his set, and one thing that he does, which is hadn't occurred to me, he has different videos pre and post class. Pre, I need you to know X, Y, Z. Post, oh, now let's do problem solving where we apply it. And it thought, why would that occur to me? I would have said, oh, let's do idea this. And he's like, no, I need two tier because I need this on the front end. Then we have that discussion. Now let's apply it within that. It's like, huh. Yeah. That so, seems like it may, it's, well, I've just probably tripled my work. But yeah. that's, yeah. that's so, so not only do I, I also do that, but not only that, all of the lectures that I do in class mm -hmm. are also videos that I've made. So if a student is absent yeah. from class, they can watch the video. Yeah. Yeah. And I even have students who watch the videos. They know what lecture I'm going to do in class. So they pre-watch the lecture. So when they come into class, they I'm reviewing for them, um, and those are the students that really excel because they're basically they they've already under, understood all the way to the level that we're going to go through in class. And then I do have videos that are post class as well, which delve a little more deeply into it.
Yeah. Yeah. Do you find you have sufficient time on your two videos per class? Even if you cut your lecture in half, you have 50 minutes, you know, 30 minutes of a lecture. And do you find you can present the entire content in the length and the lesser time of videos? Okay. Uh, to be clear, your question is, do, do the videos take less time than lecture? Uh, essentially, and you find you can cover the same content. Absolutely. So a lecture involves a lot more time for, you know, all sorts of things, technical issues, etc. Uh, I find that the videos that I create are between half and two thirds of the length of the lecture itself. How long does it take to kind of follow up to make a video? If you get the split screen. And <clears throat> Oh, so you the, the video we're making right here, uh, you can, with a whiteboard, simply set it up and talk, and you can make it in real time. Yeah. And it'll take you, you know, an extra five minutes of time before and after just with the uploading and stuff. And is that typically what you do? So my videos, I spend roughly two hours of work per minute of video. Okay. That's what I was saying. It's a much higher production value than that, though. Yeah. And you got to schedule those three students and stuff. Yeah, well, yeah, I, that's, that's not easy. Sorry. Yeah, actually, I um, at this point, for the last two years, I've been writing my scripts and lecture notes, and then I post them online, and I have a group of physics teachers that actually go through them and make suggestions and find errors, and then I film the videos and edit them and post them for that group of teachers who look over them and, again, make suggestions. So mine is a... It's a labor of love. It takes a long time, but they're, um, I'm very pleased to be able to teach people all over the planet. So. With that, I mean, our university is going to a lot of online learning also, which is among the reasons that we now have a professional quality studio with two assistants that we can record videos in. So, there's people there who can upload a script, do a teleprompter, right. you know, and and shine the lights on you so you don't look dead, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know what all they do because I've been afraid to make my first video, but <laughs> I'm going to do it before summer, you know. So they have a team. Cool. We have you up. We have people. Thanks. The team that knows all their students really well. Apparently, if you're at a university or near a university, the university has the resources. I have an unusual skill set in that I know a lot about video editing and all the lighting and all that stuff. Uh, so I just want to go back to Y Flip. So these are, uh, I wanted to keep the handwritten things up here because these are feedback that I've gotten from students about flipping. Uh, so what part of the class did you enjoy the most and why? I enjoyed the videos and the flipped philosophy. It taught me independence and helped my learning. Um, I enjoyed the light and free learning environment because it made it easy to learn. So it, it does kind of change the environment as well because it becomes a more, let's work on this together rather than I'm showing you how to do this. Uh, it was easy because everyone was learning together and I was never worried about guessing the wrong answer. It's great. Uh, and I enjoyed the flipped style classroom. Watching videos and taking notes was a really nice way to learn concepts and then solidify them in class the next day. The videos were cool and helpful. This afternoon, I'm going to be talking about the current state of my class, which I've been doing since January to talk about, which is asynchronous flipped gameful mastery learning. Um, it's transformed the way I teach my class, and it really no longer looks like it did 10 years ago. Thanks. All right, any last questions? Or, yeah. Did ask plenty. Oh, there's one. How's the video? How's the audio when you catch it a video? Uh, so I would actually, if you're going to make a bunch of videos, I would recommend not using the audio on your computer. Uh, there are relatively cheap, like twenty to thirty dollar microphones that you can get that are USB microphones to plug in. If, if some people who brought that computer had planned better in packing up their room last night, <laughs> they would have had a microphone with them. <laughs> Whoever those people are, it would have been better. So you're going to be needing a microphone. Yeah, I mean, if you're going to do a lot of videos, yeah, you should have some sort of microphone. People overlook the audio. Audio is very important. Yeah? It's probably a question for the entire group. I teach high school. We met most of you all through college. Are we teaching the students the skills they need to go to college if we sleep for the portion? 
It's a great question. So I think the thing that's interesting is how do you get them there? Um, I think that's the difficulty. So I teach first year physics course in high school, second year like APC courses as well. And the first year course, most of my what you would call reading is from physics classroom. There's a little bit of open stacks they can do. Right. But as much as I appreciate the resource of open stacks, because it was designed as an electronic document, there was very little filtering. And so if you've ever held the print copy, it's 11 pounds mm -hmm. of tiny font. And again, I appreciate the editing work that other textbooks do. But if I tried to use anything as a regular textbook, I think first year, I don't think my students would gain much. I think by the end of first year, we can use a textbook much more second year, but that there's training along the way. So you're using video preparation into your... I don't use a lot of the videos, but I do use some videos for things. Um, but I mean... So um, you don't use textbook much in what you do? I use more modeling instruction, so it definitely is flipped-like in that uh, you are doing most of the activities. There's not a lot of lecture going on in class. Sure. I think one of the important things is you have to have them read with a purpose. Mm -hmm. And just like with the videos and the quizzes and the videos, there has to be, they have to know what you want them to get out of it. So, yeah. and talking about like embed, and we had a presenter here that was in my class, I don't know, like eight or nine years ago when we were starting to um, talk about this, but it's important for the students to know what you want them to get out of that pre work, whether it's a quiz question with a video or a quiz question or something that you talk about the next day that they're reading. I think so often when we tell them to read, we just say, read the book. And that's, that's a very simple sentence to say, and it's a very complicated thing to do because you don't read a textbook the same way that you read Harry Potter, right? You just don't. Um, and so actually helping them to learn that skill is, is absolutely important. I mean, the number of times, and when I taught at other universities too, that a student would come in and say, I can't find the information to do this problem anywhere. And I would say, it's in the book. And in some extreme cases, the student would sit there in the office with me, and, and I said, well, you have to keep working on it. And there was one student that I had to say, it's on page 42. And the student still couldn't find it. And it was not like buried in there either. So you know, I think, again, knowing how to get information both in video and in print is important. Actually, just recently, um, I had a round table circle-ish discussion with my APC students. And I modify things when I ask them to do a reading. I usually do a reading quiz of some sort. Um, it could be a few questions at the beginning of class. It could be a different format. And I've, I've tended more toward discussions and those types of discussions where students are really more leading it. And I wanted feedback on what they thought was effective. And it, it was not uniform. And what was really interesting to me is the students who are more vocal okay generally thought they gained more from the discussions. And I almost would think some of the quieter students would feel they gained more because even though they're not participating, they're listening to a lot, and they did not. So I, I mean, that's like a work in progress of thinking about it, but it is very, very interesting to me that there was a dichotomy in the opinions. If, if you have a textbook and you are making the choice, which is a very good choice to see the afternoon talk on this subject and you're not coming to mind, let's talk. Okay, because <laughs> I have absolutely learned a great deal of how do you support a textbook and how crucial that is. When I, my colleagues who were involved with aspects of metacognition, they're like, I cannot believe the growing consensus that a textbook is not an important resource. This is so crucial for my class. And people are coming in at zero when it comes to a science textbook. And I, I tell them in all honesty, okay, the best high school teachers I know use a textbook twice a year when they can't reach something on the top shelf. Their students are not being introduced. And these are the best ones that I know. So it's like, wow, we have such a gap right now. Within that. So if you're going to see the afternoon within this one, I'd be very eager to share some ideas on that. And I do want to say thank you because I, yeah. I attend the Hell one and I teach in mm -hmm. Hell one. And we have consolidation and the textbook outline, of course, are very similar skills that we would see in the office. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and so that's something that it takes a year. I mean, I would have to tell you. Yeah, but I mean, why can't it be win win where we've got, again, the multiple <laughs> resources within well, the mix they, here? Absolutely. Yeah. So they, yeah. 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 The yeah. 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 session to go to the afternoon, Doug is recording one of them, and I'll record <laughs> the other one. 
So we'll have videos of both of them so that cool. you may be able to experience both. Cool. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I don't want to come off as totally anti-video, by the way. Um, right. So I could add one thing. So um, if you're like watching all this incredible stuff and the incredible quality of stuff that Jonathan is making here and saying, well, I can't do that. I can't sit up there and do three different characters and you know show examples and all that. You do demos and all that. Um, a lot of videos that some of my colleagues have been using that are very effective are not a person in front of the camera. So if you're camera shy, I presume nobody is talking shy because you're all teachers. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's also possible sometimes if you want a video about you know applying a certain concept or whatever. There's um, I think Camtasia is the thing that my colleagues have been using, right? So Camtasia is something where you can write you know with a pen, a special pen, and talk into it, and you can make you know the disembodied voice kind of video. You know, it's baby steps like that seem like the way to go. And when I start making videos, that is totally how I'm going to start. Yeah, so there's <laughs> yeah, easy ways that you can, yeah, yeah. you can yeah. flip through a PowerPoint on your own computer and record your voice. Yep. You know what I mean? So it's like a short PowerPoint aided lecture. I've, I've done that too for like using yeah. Logger Pro or some computer mm -hmm. program is, I got tired of the, okay, click here, and I'm seven steps in, and a student goes, where do I click the first time? And I just <laughs> recorded a video of, Here's where you click, here's what's going to happen, here's what you do, and then kids go, well, what do I do next? Have you watched the video? No. Watch the video. <laughs> but can you just tell me I did it in the video? <laughs> and you can pause the video. So, real quick, I did, I have flipping physics t-shirts if you want to buy one. Nice. I, they're, I tie-dyed some of them, they're hand tie-dyed, if you're interested. Yeah, go ahead. You put up, you put up a list of uh, sites that already have videos. Yeah. Can a person take those videos and do their own editing of those things? Or is so with Edpuzzle, you can, with Edpuzzle, you can take the video and you can crop it and you can take this two minute section. So it's okay. not a copyright problem? Uh, no, because what you're doing is you're still accessing the original YouTube video. You're, you're not making a copy of it, you're continuing to use that, that video. You're just adding your own things. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yep. I think it's a weird one on copyright. Apparently, at least I know at our school, if you use school resources to do something, it belongs to the school, not you. Right. So uh, is it okay with your school that you're putting all this stuff out there? I don't use any school resources. Okay. Whiteboards in this basement. Whiteboards in my basement. I actually purchased data acquisition software and probes and things. And the school and is okay with you using that in the class. Oh, oh you, the videos? Yeah. Yeah. When you were um, assigning your videos, I just want to get this okay. straight because I do use I do use your videos. I use Mrs. Wu's videos. Yeah. And and do you just do the conceptual videos, or do you do the conceptual and the sample problems? Because you have like a zillion sample problems with variations. And uh, I mean, so my students need me to walk them through a problem. That's what that's the kind of lecture they want. So I'm getting their feedback. Okay, we're definitely going to do that in class. Cool. So the so. conceptual ones would be more the ones that I do before class. The ones that would be in class would be ones that are more problem based. Although we do have some that are problem based, depending on how far into the class you are. Like if we're okay. in January, then we can do much more problem before okay. beforehand. Uh, and then afterwards, I will sometimes have optional videos, which are which are just problems, basically. And sometimes they're actually, I've taken their homework problems and I've made videos out of them so that they can actually watch me walk through the entire solution, not just read the solution, which is different. Yep. Um, so have you compared assessment? Have you compared your videos to students after you started the, 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 the classroom? with the previous years to see if there's a performance jump or? Uh, the answer is I switched schools. No, <laughs> uh, so I, I don't really have that data because I, I started flipping my classes and it was such an awesome thing that I left the class. <laughs> um, and I started making the videos and switched schools. So I, I can't compare what my students are doing at this different school to what they were doing at the previous school. I just can't do it. So, no, unfortunately. I, I'm sort of an assessment side. I don't know of a single study that says that students achieve better within the classroom the smaller their prior knowledge when they show up. <laughs> <laughs> the more that you can do within an active space that's dependent on their prior knowledge, 
There's many that will say there are games with that. I don't know any that counter that. There's uh, back to the question as far as, well, what will this mean if I'm in high school as far as next step? There's this big study that just came out in science that a couple colleagues are on, which is cool, where they look, it's about the state of STEM education and higher education in North America. What are going on within the classrooms? They looked at many, many different disciplines within that, and they have found that right now, STEM instruction, there's like sort of three different profiles. There's ones that are predominantly lecture, where the instructor is lecturing 90% of the time, perhaps asking clicker questions. There's a next one where it's a punctuated lecture, where the instructor is talking about 40 to 60% of the times, supplementing that with clicker questions or other group discussion. That's my class. Then the last one is ones where there's a greater emphasis on even more prior knowledge coming in. The amount of instruction in there might be no more than 30%, and the students are oftentimes in small groups, perhaps going through different worksheet activities, and there is either times when the instructor brings all those ideas back together, but sometimes not even that. Sometimes you've got the prior, now you show up, small groups, we'll work our way around, work on these worksheets. Or, you know, within that subset. Right now, and I won't say they're one-third, 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 but those are the three models that are really in use right now in higher ed. We gotta do this. We're gonna go. yeah. <laughs> well, first of all, we're still waiting for Lunara to show up. So Lenora's waiting upstairs with the cart. Oh. She's here. Lunch will be brought down a la carte. Oh, nice. Uh, yeah. That was not me, by the way. Yeah, that was good. It's not impressive. That's why it wasn't me. Not yet.